The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, that is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God has promised that he would magnify his word above his name. He has said that the flowers of the field will fade, the grass will wither, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Therefore, we give close attention to the word of God, and we continue our study uh, today in the doctrine of love, and this should conclude it, increment number five, uh, for this particular class, and uh, I hope that it's been helpful to you, for I don't know of uh, any other doctrine other than the doctrine of the grace of God that uh, actually is more valuable to the believer be and more useful to the believer in every circumstance and situation of life. I would imagine that, uh, I hate, hesitate to say hundreds of times a day, but certainly many, many times each day it is absolutely essential for the believer to utilize the principle of unconditional love in order to survive relationships with people. And I, I, I've never been in a situation where there's no relationship with people, but regardless of uh, whether you're with people or with not, I would assume that this doctrine is very, very important because you think about relationships with people. So, in preparation for our study, let's spend a few moments in silent prayer. Using the principle of confession of sin, 1 John 1, 9, if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. What a privilege, Heavenly Father, it is to have this provision of your grace, unconditional love, for us to be able to orient to relationships with other members of the human race. Thank you for the study we've enjoyed to this point, and I pray that as I conclude it this day, that God the Holy Spirit would direct my thinking and my teaching and cause each believer who is listening at this point in time to be drawn to the place where you can fill or control them and at the same time produce this magnificent love in them. I ask in Jesus' dear name, amen. We are uh, now under uh, point P in the doctrine of love, which is problems that result from the lack of unconditional love. And uh, we have uh, noted that uh, since unconditional love is a major problem-solving device in the Christian way of life, and since unconditional love comes only through spiritual growth, the importance of consistent study and application of Bible doctrine becomes very, very evident. That led us to point two, and that was unrealistic expectations. Very few people are loved the way they want to be loved, or treated the way, the way they want to be treated. Because of this, people develop subjective arrogance, which interposes frustrations, which distract us from doctrine and destroy the true focus of the Christian life, which is occupation with the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of us have our druthers. All of us would like certain things to be true. And in an emotional area, we, if the emotions are controlling the soul, as I have just recently taught in the other Bible class, the Tuesday Bible class, on the subject of spiritual decline, emotions uh, are so unreliable that they actually make wishful thinking something that is true uh, to us. It's not real truth, it's pseudo-truth, because it's based on those things. But if you live by the emotions, the, the feelings, uh, 
if you if you like certain things and you want certain things and you uh, emotionally desire certain things uh, and you don't receive them then uh, you have no control over your life you're going to become very frustrated and subjective and you're going to assume that uh, what you wish is true or real uh, for example if a person uh, likes uh, in, a, in a marriage relationship uh, likes to be uh, cuddled or hugged and I'm one of those uh, types myself I, I like that kind of, of a relationship I, I, I look uh, forward to that kind of relationship but if a person uh, desires uh, uh, that kind of a relationship and doesn't find this under uh, uh, attraction love for the one that is their uh, mate then you see the emotions are going to take over and unreality is going to become a reality and they're going to therefore justify the fact that they're going to be looking for uh, someone else uh, other than their mate who will give them what they expect and uh, whether they ever find it or not uh, they will never find the perfect person who is going to give them everything that they expect. That's the reason that it's imperative that the believer learn that under the filling or the control of the Holy Spirit, whatever you expect or desire from your mate, uh, you must be able to uh, realize that if your mate does not give you that kind of a response, then you have an alternative other than leaving or other than looking for another mate or, uh, or searching and finding for some kind of fulfillment in something else and it may be a hobby, it may be sports it may be losing yourself in work or it may be promiscuous uh, living, looking for uh, another woman who will uh, give you that kind of, uh, uh, of uh, whatever you want and therefore you destroy your own spiritual life however if on the other hand you, under the power of the Holy Spirit you can switch to unconditional love and you recognize that even though you do not get what you want even though you are not treated the way you want to be treated you are treated the way you want to be treated by God and while you can't feel in your emotions the hugs from God or the cuddling from God uh, then you are it's very very possible for you to uh, under the production of the Holy Spirit to be satisfied with what God provides for you and to be fulfilled in the kind of a love that you relax in an unconditional love from God that says no matter what you are no matter who you are no matter how you fail no matter what happens in your life you are not going to uh, ever lose that glorious relationship and no matter how unfaithful you are to him and how you may disappoint him and and fail to achieve all that God has for you nevertheless he will never ever uh, leave you he will never forsake you he will never let you down he will never abandon you he will never just turn you over uh, and get rid of you he, that's not the way he is he loves you and he loves you to the very end uh, of your life and beyond for he has for all of us a glorious eternity so this uh, uh, unrealistic expectations is a very very important part uh, of our lives and uh, you must remember that um, just because you are not treated uh, the way you want to be treated you have no justification for taking your eyes off of the Lord Jesus Christ and placing them on yourself which is arrogance on this others which is lust or on the things which is uh, covetousness now point three problems that result from the lack of unconditional love is role model arrogance Society and people in general have assigned certain customary functions to certain activities in life. That is, we expect uh, certain things from politicians, certain things from ministers, pastors. Uh, we expect certain things from our husbands, certain things from our wives, uh, certain things from our teachers, certain things from the military, certain things from the police, uh, and we expect certain things from the successful and famous these people are all expected to function in a certain way and I think each of us have different expectations uh, from uh, each of this uh, these categories of people uh, and uh, uh, conversely looking at it from their viewpoint if a person tries 
to be what everyone expects him to be, he ends up a, a psychopathic personality. You can never be what everyone expects you to be. You need to be yourself. And uh, the problem with expectation is uh, uh, if, if you do not function uh, in a way that certain people expect you to function, then they protest loudly. Th this, uh, therefore, means that most of us go through life with a double standard. That is, we have the standard that we set for our lives, and then we have the standard that is set for us by someone else. Uh, our parents may set a standard for our lives uh, that uh, 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 assign to us a certain function that they feel we should we should have our uh, our uh, children will uh, assign to us certain uh, characteristics that they uh, assume should be true uh, of us. Uh, but although, uh, everyone needs to, to realize the, the fact that we do respect, we do honor, we do have a great deal of, of uh, uh, confidence uh, in uh, some people. Some people we place on a pedestal. That's called making an icon out of them. And when anyone departs from the role model that uh, you and I have set for them, that person is condemned, rejected, criticized, and maligned. Uh, I'm thinking uh, uh, of the, uh, I think it was the rock star who was murdered by the, the president of her own fan club because uh, she didn't do something exactly the way the president of the fan club expected her uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, act or to, to something she didn't do what her, her fan club the president expected her to do. It's easy for a person to turn from uh, role model uh, arrogance to iconoclastic arrogance in which uh, you uh, tear down the object of uh, your uh, your uh, arrogance. Now, I'm going to deal with that in point four, but uh, let me simply say that those who criticize uh, the ro person that they set up uh, as an icon or made a, uh, a used in role model arrogance, uh, they are sinning and they are operating on a double standard because they expect one thing of their role model and something else of themselves. And uh, such criticism uh, will uh, imply that certain sins are worse than others, when in the eyes of God all sins are exactly the same, except for the seven sins, it's called the seven deadly sins, which are listed in Proverbs 6, verses 16 to 19. Most of us uh, individuals, as well as society in which we live, like to see everything in its proper place, and we resent any deviation in assigned thought, action, and personality. This is especially true of legalistic believers and those with self-righteous arrogance. The individual excuses himself for his own sins and failures, but he condemns the role model for identical sins and identical failures. Among Christians, role model arrogance manufactures hypocrisy as well as legalism, two of the characteristics of self-righteous arrogance. Role model arrogance causes believers to fail because of a lack of unconditional love for all mankind and lack of occupation with the person of Jesus Christ instead of occupation. Instead of that, they have occupation with their role model. Role model arrogance manufactures hypocrisy in uh, those who are members of the quote-unquote clergy and it also manufactures legalism in the congregation. I don't know if you've uh, ever been in a congregation in which Certain norms and standards are set up for everyone in the congregation by a few people, and those who deviate become the object of, uh, of uh, scorn, of, of criticism, of uh, uh, rejection, maligning, and all of those things. Uh, for example, going back many, many years, uh, when I was first saved, uh, divorce uh, in the congregation made a person a second-class citizen. They were not allowed to be uh, on the boards of deacons. They could not teach a class. There were many areas in which they were assigned a status of second-class citizen, and it was uh, certainly uh, difficult uh, for anyone who went through that experience uh, uh, in those years uh, to, to, to be accepted because, you see, everyone would assign 
uh, the fact that uh, they should be the husband of one wife because I am the husband of one wife or the wife of one husband, whatever it may be. Uh, and uh, though I may be excused for uh, mental attitude sins, uh, they are not excused because uh, they did not maintain their marriage. So role model arrogance ignores the basic doctrine that all believers after salvation continue to have an old sin nature and continue a rate of personal sinning which is compatible with the lust pattern of their old sin nature and their ignorance of Bible doctrine. It just depends on the trends of their old sin nature what they're going to do. Certain sins, uh, according to uh, uh, most of us, are, are extremely reprehensible but it all depends on the trend of our old sin nature which things we consider uh, to be uh, the most uh, grievous sins. In the role model arrogance and the feet of clay syndrome you cannot impose impossible perfect standards on others while you ignore the fact that you too have sinned and are possibly committing worse sins than those which you condemn in your role model. Without consistent perception of Bible doctrine resulting in the development of unconditional love for all mankind, the freedom of self-determination is destroyed, and both the privacy of the priesthood and the environment for learning Bible doctrine are replaced by some form of spiritual tyranny. I told you that my son John was telling me that in the merger of uh, uh, Grace uh, Memorial Bible Church and the Evangelical Christian Church, that from both, both congregations came the criticism uh, of me and my teaching on the privacy of the priesthood, uh, pointing out that um, uh, I was uh, uh, went overboard on the privacy of the priesthood, and that Bill Gokenauer got up and uh, said that there was a time that he was hurting and he uh, felt that it was uh, uh, wrong because nobody uh, showed him sympathy uh, from Grace Memorial Bible Church. Well, see, he set in role model arrogance a certain condition for me that I was to react in a specific way. Now, uh, I can tell you, uh, between you and me, that uh, I was extremely uh, cognizant of uh, when he was going through difficulties and hurting, and I, was, I did, went out of my way to uh, help him in uh, multitudes of situations, though I never in any of those situations called attention to myself or what I was doing. As a matter of fact, the only reason that he became the pastor of Grace Memorial Bible Church was because, uh, when I resigned, was because of my intervention and my concern for him. Uh, he would never have made it had I not uh, stepped in and uh, uh, intervened on his behalf, which he totally ignored and rejected and uh, assumed the wrong things. But the point is, uh, that's neither here nor there, but you see, self-pity causes the clouding of the thinking processes and unreality becomes uh, a reality and you believe what you think rather than to uh, believe what is actually true. And in a case uh, of a situation like that, uh, let me point this out. What difference does it make who in the world is concerned about what happened to you or to me? Uh, it doesn't make any difference unless I want someone to, in feeling sorry for me to give me money or to do something for me. Otherwise, the only one that really uh, counts what he thinks about me and my situation is the one who can do something about it, and that's the Lord. The Lord is the Lord of omnipotence, and he can change the situation if, that I'm going through if he, if he uh, wants to. If he doesn't, then I assume that it is his will that I'm going to go through this circumstance or this situation, and in going through it, it's going to be for my best interest. I'm going, uh, it is for my uh, good that he is allowing these things to continue. And so uh, it, it's, it's tragic when uh, this thing happens in a congregation. The, the privacy of the priesthood simply means that every believer has a right to live his life as unto the Lord without someone else interfering in that life without someone else telling him how to live his life, how to run his life, what to do in his life. Now I'm cognizant of the fact that many pastors are, are just the opposite of that. They do not give people the, 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 the privilege of privacy. Uh, and I've uh, told you again uh, that uh, uh, when I was gone uh, for my honeymoon, Jan and I were gone on our honeymoon, and we came back and we found that uh, our two assistant pastors 
uh, had uh, at that time uh, uh, Dave Shoppy and Bob Pauley had uh, taken uh, and approached one of the girls in our congregation because of who she was dating. That's none of their business. They have no right to interfere in that privacy. If she makes a decision to date the wrong person uh, because she violates what Scripture has ta taught her, then that's the law of volitional responsibility. She has to assume the responsibility for making a volitional decision that was wrong and suffer the, the uh, self-induced misery that uh, is, is involved in it. And secondly, the divine discipline which comes along with it because all of uh, what we can tell her to do is, uh, is uh, nothing more than what doctrine has already told her uh, unless we reach beyond what doctrine has taught and specifically interfere in that person's life. There's no way that uh, uh, you can uh, reform, uh, that you, any, and there's no way that you can interfere in other people's life without uh, some form of spiritual tyranny. And it's also arrogant self-righteousness because you assume that you, have, you are so spiritual that you have the right to interfere in somebody else's life and tell them how to live. And really you don't. Nobody has. Only the Lord can do it. And listen, the Lord has never needed any help from you or from me in a circumstance and situation like that. Role model arrogance distracts congregations from doctrine by emphasizing the personality of the communicator rather than the message. Remember, the principle is that it's not the man, it's the message that counts. And uh, there are multitudes of people who cannot listen to uh, the pastor because uh, he doesn't have the personality, the sweetness and light personality that they think he should have. Remember this, no one is perfect. But with Bible doctrine as the number one priority of your life, you learn to love God the Father. You learn to insert unconditional love into human relationships. From knowledge of doctrine, you find your true role, role model, who is perfect, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our only role model, and listen, beloved, you have no problems in putting him on a pedestal because he is worthy of being placed there. But when you continue... Uh, or you combine unrealistic expectations with role model arrogance, you have established false standards for your life. You have developed an arrogant system of mores which hinder both the execution of the plan of God and create spiritual failure. And that leads to uh, number four uh, and the problems that result from the lack of unconditional love, the problem of, of iconoclastic arrogance, which I've already touched on. Iconoclasm is the function of destroying an icon or an idol. Iconoclastic arrogance is related to role model arrogance, but is defined as the subjective preoccupation with other people. This results in the creation of role model or an icon when you are, uh, when you are preoccupied with other people. Uh, and uh, the great illustration of this uh, would be uh, when uh, uh, Absalom came back uh, after the uh, murder uh, of uh, uh, his half-brother and his, his uh, uh, rejection by the king eventually came back. Well, he, he, he uh, stayed at the gate and uh, became a judge at the gate of the city of Jerusalem. And in so doing, when anybody from the northern kingdom came by, he said, well, my father is very busy. I'll be happy to adjudicate your case. And he was always very, very gracious to them. And he, he really won their allegiance by... Uh, uh, being at the gate and uh, stealing uh, the, the love of the northern kingdom. And there have been many assistant pastors who have done the very same thing uh, because some people under role model arrogance have uh, uh, established a situation in which uh, the pastor uh, does not measure up to their uh, personality type and the assistant pastor does. So they begin to uh, reject the pastor uh, and uh, adhere to the assistant pastor and so you have uh, uh, two congregations within a church uh, people who will adhere to one that was really the basic situ the basic condition of the early split the, the great the large split that took place uh, at uh, grace when we were still downtown there were a lot of mitigating circumstances the, the continuing debt but really there were a lot of people who were attracted to uh, someone else and did not uh, like my personality and uh, this whole group of people eventually left the congregation in one fell swoop and uh, uh, really uh, we suffered uh, greatly as a result of that and uh, they uh, maintained 
uh, that uh, uh, allegiance uh, for a period of time. But anyway, the point is this. Um, uh, iconoclastic arrogance has four different functions. First of all, an excessive admiration or attraction love for some other person that creates from of that person an idol. This then is followed by the idol showing their feet of clay. That is, they do something wrong. Uh, many people will come and they will love the pastor and somewhere along the line he does something wrong. When the idol does something wrong, and that may be real, he really does something wrong, or it may be something that you imagine, there is a reaction by those who have created the idol. They become disillusioned or disenchanted as phase one or stage one of spiritual decline, a reactor factor. Fourthly, this uh, uh, disenchantment and disillusionment uh, is iconoclastic arrogance which now seeks to destroy the image that the person has created. You created the idol, now you do not like the idol, so you seek to destroy the idol. And uh, generally it's done by means of, of uh, innuendo, of gossip, and so forth. But iconoclastic arrogance is really divorced from reality in human relationships because of either ignorance or rejection of Bible doctrine or because of the lack of unconditional love for all mankind on the one hand and lack of occupation with Christ on the other. You can be sure as long as you have set up an icon somewhere, you are not using our Lord Jesus Christ as the role model uh, of your life. Arrogance takes an ordinary person and from a deluded idealism or romantic illusion fashions this person in his mind into an ideal of perfection. The idol of perfection created by this arrogance can be a spiritual image, a personality image, a hero image, a romantic image, a beautiful image. This is not admiration. This is something excessive. Uh, it can happen in a relationship. Uh, you're, you're, you, uh, as a young man, you meet this perfect woman. Uh, and uh, while uh, she may be perfect for you uh, in God's plan, that doesn't mean she's perfect. And then uh, uh, you, uh, she's the most beautiful, the most wonderful person. And uh, in the dating, uh, she always puts her best foot forward. In the engagement, she puts her best foot forward. And this could be him, you know, he, um, either way, male or female. But whatever the situation, they put their best foot forward. And the wedding is beautiful, the honeymoon is lovely, and you start to live. But only uh, very few people can keep on living that image that they set forth. And sooner or later, reality sets in that this uh, person I married is not all that I thought she was. Uh, this uh, man is not all I thought he was. And as a result of this, there is an arrogant reaction of disillusion or disenchantment. And it's very possible to become vindictive, implacable, bitter, hateful, and motivated to revenge to destroy that person. Uh, it may take many years, but it will actually happen. Iconoclastic arrogance destroys friendship, romance, marriage, business, professional relationships, Christian fellowship, and a spiritual leader of some kind. This results, of course, in rejection of Bible doctrine. The sooner a congregation has attained unconditional love, the sooner it will overlook idiosyncrasies, mannerisms, habits, and failures of those in spiritual leadership. Iconoclastic arrogance is a major cause for apostasy among believers, beginning with the uh, reactor factor of uh, stage one of uh, spiritual decline, disappointment with friends, with loved ones, uh, for the pastor, for others in the congregation, who those who were friends, um, uh, all of us are going to be disappointed at one time or another with someone who was in a situation like this. You're going to be disenchanted or disappointed with your friends. You're going to be disappointed with someone you love. You're going to be disappointed with those in authority. But disenchantment and a disillusionment from idolizing that person is failure. We must take responsibility for our own thoughts, our own actions, our own decisions. The arrogant iconoclast never blames himself for what he has done in creating the idol and then destroying it, but in, in irrationality he always blames the idol for existing by his own fantasizing. No, arrogance never takes responsible for being arrogant, for arrogance is responsible for creating the idol, and arrogance is responsibility for destroying it. Three problem-solving devices are necessary to bring that believer back to reality and to recover from the devastating 
the devastation done to his spiritual life. First of all, attraction, love for God the Father. Secondly, occupation with the Lord Jesus Christ. And thirdly, unconditional love for all mankind. Principle number five, or problem number five, that results from the lack of unconditional love is the principle of changing people. Unconditional love never implies controlling or changing people to conform to your standards. Beloved, remember, you cannot change people to conform to your personal standards and your expectations. You see, and this is very often the case in marriage. Uh, if you do not understand that the person you married is imperfect, that the person you married has uh, flaws, has trends in the Olsen nature, and you are expecting uh, perfection, the next thing that you do is to seek to try to change that person into whatever it is that you have set up as the ideal behavior pattern for your mate. In other words, your mate must never do this. Your mate must never be that. Your mate must always respond in exactly the same way to the circumstance and situation. And when uh, this is arrogance, because you are now uh, trying to control that person, you are trying to change that person. And you must always remember this, beloved. You can never change other people. You can only change yourself. As a result, it produces fantastic frustration, and it breaks up marriages, it breaks up friendships, it does all kinds of things. But part of the problem created by power and approbation lust is the function of the legalistic believer trying to control and change the lives of other believers to conform to his or her personal standards. <coughs> Pardon me, talked about that earlier. The only changes that count in the Christian life are changes that are made by Bible doctrine resident in your soul. Only Bible doctrine changes lives. God the Holy Spirit takes the doctrine you have learned, applies it to you, and you from the source of your very own volition will make the, the, the uh, submission to God the Holy Spirit and allow Him to change your life and to be what God wants you to be. That's the real change that's required and that's the only change that counts. Self-righteous arrogance is the motivation for legalism, which is always trying to control others apart from the Word of God. The teaching of Bible doctrine is the only protection against this. Now, many legalists will take the Word of God and say, this is what the Word of God says. Maybe the commandments is the Word of God commands this, that, or the other thing. And a person who does not measure up to those commands then it has to be changed, and you seek to, to, to change them. As a matter of fact, that's what a lot of pastors are, try, are looking for constantly. They are expecting their sermons to change people. And that's arrogant. Your sermons and my sermons are not going to change people. Only God, the Holy Spirit, and Bible doctrine can change people. And what I seek to do in my communication is to teach what doctrine says. As you hear it, you, uh, you believe it, and then it's up to you to respond by asking God, the Holy Spirit, to make that change in your attitudes and in your thinking. And he will do that because that's what doctrine requires. That how, that's what doctrine uh, demands in your life. But you cannot change people by imposing standards on them under role model uh, arrogance syndrome. You can't make a role model of some person without becoming disappointed, frustrated, and react because sooner or later they're going to violate your personal standards and expectations. Again, the only true model is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, you can change one life, and that is your own. But you can't change other people in your periphery. But, and that's what the issue is in this problem, you see. An unconditional love, you accept them for the way they are. Only by changing yourself can you avoid unrealistic expectations and role model arrogance. Changing yourself is a matter of daily perception and application of Bible doctrine in your soul, learning and using the problem-solving devices of the plan of God. This includes, includes, of course, attraction, love for God the Father, unconditional love for all mankind, and, of course, occupation with the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And, and you know, it's tragic because you can never relax 
in a situation like that. You can't relax and be yourself because you always have to worry about am I measuring up to what this other person expects? Am I doing what this person expects of me? Am I uh, being what this person expects me to be? And you, you're always uh, on pins and needles. You're, uh, you're always sitting on the edge of your chair. You're always wondering, uh, uh, have I done the right thing? Have I done the wrong thing? If uh, somehow that person is having a bad day and they withdraw and become uh, rather quiet and so on, you, you, uh, right away okay, you think, uh-oh, what have I done now? Because you're, you're walking on eggs all the time and you're, you're never, never, ever relaxed and never really happy because you're always concerned, uh-oh, did I say the wrong thing? Uh-oh, did I do the wrong thing? What have I done to, uh, to uh, alienate her now or him? What have I done now? And uh, it's, a, it's a terribly difficult life to live. And so the best thing to do is to uh, forget about the other person and what they are and what they do and transform yourself by the con continual inhale of Bible doctrine. Now, self-righteous arrogance motivates all kinds of legalism. The vanity of the unique experience, which glorifies empiricism over Bible doctrine. You have had this uh, experience, uh, and everyone else needs to have the same uh, experience that you have had, whether it's speaking in tongues or uh, uh, the glorious uh, rosy glow that came after you believed or uh, whatever uh, the unique experience is. Uh, erroneous emphasis on human achievement, human talent or human ability is another motivation, uh, uh, another form of legalism that self-righteous arrogance motivates. Uh, thirdly, self-righteous arrogance becomes irrational when the believer commits some sin and shocks himself. This results in conceited conclusions that Bible doctrine doesn't work or that you've lost your salvation or that the plan of God has failed because you have failed. Fourthly, self-righteous arrogance, motivated by legalism, establishes false standards and seeks to force these false standards on other believers. This motivates various functions of legalism, such as seeking to dominate people, policy, and authority in your periphery, establishing non-biblical standards and seeking to impose these standards on others, attacking the teaching of Bible doctrine, the content, the communicator, the emphasis of doctrine. This results in self-righteous arrogance seeking to superimpose personal and false opinions over the Word of God. If the pastor's teaching doesn't concur with your false and legalistic concepts, then self-righteous arrogance attacks the pastor, seeking to discredit the person and his ministry. <coughs> Problem number six that results from lack of unconditional love is unconditional love is a problem-solving device, or I should say point, not problem, but unconditional love is a problem-solving device. Oh, I can't emphasize it enough, beloved. Unconditional love provides the solution to unrealistic expectations and role model arrogance so that the spiritually adult believer can pass people testing, system testing, and thought testing. Uh, people who rub you the wrong way, who do you things the wrong way, rotten systems, thoughts that are constantly coming to you, what do you do? You switch to unconditional love and live and let live. Unconditional love for all mankind gives the spiritual adult the ability to un overcome any form of hurt, frustration, anger, bitterness, implacability, and hatred toward others who have failed as a role model or who are not treating you or loving you the way you want to be loved. You may, they may not have been a role model, but at least you're not being treated or loved the way you want to be loved. How do you handle them? Only by means of unconditional love. The greater your preoccupation with yourself, the greater your expectation from people. The greater your romantic notions, the more you anticipate from the opposite sex, both in romance and marriage. The higher your standards, the greater perfection you assign to the person uh, who is your role model. But the solution is not found in reaction to people who don't treat you the way you want to be treated or who don't love you the way you want to be loved. The solution is, found in, is not found anywhere in arrogance, 
in self-centeredness, in jealousy, in bitterness, in vindictiveness, in implacability, in revenge motivation, revenge hatred, anger, or self-pity. It is not related to uh, your real, uh, mental attitude toward other people. The principle is that you cannot change people to conform to your standards and your expectations. But you can solve the problems to related to frustrations that come from unrealistic expectations. But only through the use of unconditional love as a problem-solving device and an unconditional love which is produced by God, the Holy Spirit. Seven, unconditional love is the basic solution to the problems of marriage. Again, I have recently taught the doctrine of marriage and if you haven't got it and would like to have it, I'll be happy to send it to you. But marriages fail because people are no better in marriage as they are as people. Marriages fail because people are failures as human beings. And all of us are failures as human beings because all of us have old sin natures. And when one expects too much of the person to whom one is married, one fails to understand that one is married to a human being, a person who has flaws and failures and an old sin nature. Sometimes marriages fail because people get married for the wrong reason. Therefore, they make the wrong decisions concerning the spouse. Marriages fail because people think marriage is the solution to all their problems in life. In fact, marriage is a problem manufacturing device and gives you more opportunities to create problems than to solve problems. Because instead of having one person, you have two people who are living together, two people who have old sin natures, and those old sin natures may be compatible in some areas, but they're going to clash in other areas, and it's going to produce problems. One of the great fallacies that marriage is designed for happiness. Mar you know, uh, you make me happy. Listen, nobody can make you happy except God when he shares his happiness with you through Bible doctrine. Marriage is not designed for happiness. It's designed for virtue. Now, there will be times when you, you're in marriage you will be ecstatically happy because of certain relationship with another person who is very, very wonderful to you. But you, you, you tend to expect that that's going to be the same all the time. You tend to expect that your, your, the happiness that you have with your mate will be uh, the norm and standard. When... <clears throat> pardon me, because your mate is imperfect, there are times when that person is going to make you miserable. If you're depending on that person for your happiness, you're going to be miserable. Virtue is what, what you need in marriage. And virtue is something that you have. And virtue is designed for happiness. Therefore, happiness in marriage de demands virtue on your part. Now, you can't change your marital problems by changing your spouse to conform to your personal standards or your unrealistic expectations. Or in your case, you always think they're realistic expectations. Don't I have a right to expect from my mate thus and so? So they're realistic to you, but in reality they're unrealistic expectations. Because nobody can expect in someone else something that is not true of that person. Unless you have the arrogance to think, well, since I'm married to that person, I've changed him or I've changed her or I will change him or her. Therefore, marriage is more than finding the right person. Marriage is being the right person. And marriage requires, beloved, I can't emphasize enough, marriage requires the use of, of unconditional love more often than you dare to realize. And if you realize before how much unconditional love is required in marriage, maybe you would say it's better off not to be married, better off to be alone than to, than to have to face uh, all these problems which are uh, raised in marriage. Well, that's not true. Because you see, as a believer, you have the resource of unconditional love provided by God for you to use so that you can live with another person. Live consistently, live for a long time, get along, put up with the idiosyncrasies. Uh, and it's going to be, that will produce a compatible relationship. 
And there will be times of fantastic happiness that you will share together. But there will also be times in which the only thing that will carry you in your marriage will be unconditional love that God the Holy Spirit provides in your soul through the filling of the Spirit plus the knowledge and application of doctrine. Ninthly, let's look at the problem of attraction love. Attraction love for mankind falls basically into three categories, all of which are optional. Friendship is an optional love minus sex. Romance is an optional love between a man and a woman minus sex. Marriage is an optional love between a man and a woman plus sex. Optional love means that the Bible does not command the believer to enter into these attraction love relationships. Attraction love is an option in your life. In other words, you're never commanded to have a friend, to have a romance, or to be married. Those are options you choose for yourself. Attraction love is the option of life in friendship, romance, and marriage. Unconditional love is the imperative in the Christian way of life. You are commanded and ordered by the Word of God to have unconditional love for everyone. Attraction love is discriminating and selective because it's based on a rapport that you have with the object. The more particular you are in attraction love, the better, for you're going to eliminate a lot of people. On the other hand, unconditional love is non-discriminating. It, it extends to absolutely every person in the whole human race. Now, anyone can fall in love. Anyone can make a friend. Yet, unconditional love requires the believer to advance to spiritual adulthood before it becomes an effective problem-solving device. It actually begins as spiritual adulthood is reached and it keeps on getting better and better and more and more inclusive uh, as you grow in grace to the time you reach spiritual maturity in which your unconditional love is at a maximum. Uh, it, is man, it is the mandated unconditional love for all of mankind that is the problem-solving device in human interaction and in human relationships. Therefore, unconditional love for all mankind is uh, uh, what is demanded by God. Without unconditional love, attraction love in the human race is vulnerable and weak. It's influenced by too many factors which hinder its perpetuation. So attraction, love, and friendship, romance, or marriage can't be sustained or perpetuated without the problem-solving device of unconditional love undergirding your attraction love. Attraction love minus unconditional love is destroyed by arrogance, jealousy, pettiness, vindictiveness, implacability, hypersensitivity as arrogance, subject, subjectivity, anger, hatred, fickleness, a change of environment or a change of values. Well, unconditional love is absolutely necessary because whoever you love will have something unattractive about him or her at one time or another. Uh, some, it'll be more often than others. Uh, if so, then you live for that one moment that uh, you're waiting, you anticipate everything in all of your life uh, revolves around that one moment when you can have that attraction love rapport and when that person is very very attractive ah but alas and alack that person becomes unattractive and you know something it might be that the older that person gets the more unattractive that one gets uh, and uh, there's nothing you can do about changing it so you have to have uh, the fantastic provision of God's unconditional love. Now, thank you, loving Heavenly Father, for our study. May God the Holy Spirit take these things and use them as a source of blessing and challenge so that each believer may recognize what you are expecting uh, of them. And that is, to you, you have commanded us to have unconditional love for every member of the human race. Therefore, what you have commanded, you have made possible 
and you have made it possible on a grace basis by the inhale of Bible doctrine plus the control or filling of God the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is possible for us to achieve that mandate and to have unconditional love. We thank you that uh, from time to time you do provide us with those who can be the objects of attraction love. We do know that we can rest in the attraction love that we have for, for you, for God the Son, for God the Holy Spirit, and know that that attraction love will never disappoint us. But we do thank you that from time to time there are people in the human race who we will find attractive and who will be the object of our attraction love. And uh, yet, when we find they have feet of clay, when we find that they don't measure up in every area that we expect them to, that undergirding that, we, that when that attraction fails or fades, we still have the unconditional love for them, that we can live and enjoy life. Thank you for this fantastic problem-solving device. And may God the Holy Spirit make it very, very real to us and bring to our mind our study very often. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.